How many hours and years of our lives do we spend on work? For nearly all of us, we spend 30 plus years and one third of our days in our vocation. More time, perhaps, than we spend at rest or at play. But this isn't a problem. Why? Because work is good. Work needs to be integrated deeply into our lives and must be in line with our most important goals and values. And if it is, we have a far more complete and fulfilling life experience. Welcome to the How People Work podcast, where we explore the intersection of how humans think and act and how they apply themselves to their work. When you understand both of these things, you'll be equipped to be insightful, compassionate, and compelling leaders. Welcome back to the How People Work podcast. I'm Jason Murray. I'm here with my co-host and co-founder of Fringe, Jordan Peace. Hey there. Uh, And on this podcast, we talk about the intersection of how humans work as individuals and how they apply themselves to work. And hopefully that helps us to be more insightful, compassionate, compelling leaders of Mm. people and company builders. Um, And so today uh, we're continuing some of the themes that came out of our first episode where we talked a little bit about our Genesis story, just what is Fringe? How did we get started? A little bit of our backstory and even why we're passionate about uh, some of these topics. And yeah. so I think the the sort of overarching premise, if you will, that might be helpful for people to understand uh, that I think will be common, but we wanna dig into this in a little bit more detail is just how are the various generations out there in the workforce impacting the way that work is getting done, impacting the way that uh, generations are interacting with uh, their employers and yeah. what does that relationship look like? And I use that word relationship very intentionally here because I think it is very much so that. So maybe pop quiz, surprise wow. to start us off Thank with. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Can you name the generations that are in the workforce today? I, I think so. <laughs> uh, we've got the baby boomers. Yes. The Gen Xers. Yes which I refer to as the baby boomer carbon copies, uh, the, which is probably not fair. The Gen Four Y Gen or X-ers. millennial, yeah, two names for our generation. And then the Gen Zs, right? Did I miss anybody? That's four of them. Oh, no. Who did I miss? You got some stragglers. No way. In the silent generation. Oh, Bless wow. their hearts if they're still working. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I never thought about that. But there are some that are still out there for them. in the workforce. Salute. I just, I just saw a story today about a, a great grandmother got her master's degree at 87 years old. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Apparently they were so silent you forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. Uh, so we got the generations here. That, that's probably common knowledge to most of us. Except for that for last it. one, maybe. Well, yeah. It's not common to me. Um, one of the things I think would be really interesting, though, is to talk about, you know, especially in the workplace, Yeah. Um, how are we starting to experience some of the different expectations of these generations who are coming into the workforce? And so maybe in particular, mm. millennials and Gen Z. And I think why that's of particular importance yeah. is the scale of the workforce that those two generations in particular represent. And so I'm going to look at my notes to make sure I get my uh, stats correct here. Please so do that because someone's going to fact check you. Someone's going to fact check this, um, but this is legitimate. So millennials already make up 35% okay. of the workforce um, and Gen Z currently stands at about 7%, mm-hmm. 7 to 10%. Um, what I think is actually staggering is by 2025, uh, over 30% of the workforce is estimated to be Gen Z. And so wow. we're about to see a massive change in yeah. the number of employees yeah. represented in the workforce by Gen Z. And so what that means then is two thirds of the workforce by 2030 is going to be millennials and Gen Z. And so I think it's a a special importance to talk about what's going on with those generations. Yeah. So just as you've been in the business and yeah. you know been working in this space, what are some of the things that you've noticed along the way around expectations of 
these different generations. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that stood out to me the more we we not only observe but also research and even write about this and podcast about this and interview other folks about this. I remember I, I interviewed a cultural anthropologist one time. It was a fascinating interview and learned a lot from that conversation. Um, but what what you find is that human beings across generations, they much of what they want at their core is the same. The way they want that communicated or delivered or who they want that message from or, 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 or mm -hmm. changes dramatically across generations, right? And then sometimes there's things that just, they, it's just completely new. A generation pops up, they have new needs, new desires that just, mostly because of technology and just advances in the world that, either that opportunity or that thing just wasn't available in the past. But as, as an example of something that is commonplace, right? Everybody wants to feel seen and heard. Everybody wants to feel appreciated at work, right? That appreciation in, let's say, the workplace 30 years ago probably would have come through the form of something transactional. Mm -hmm. It would have come through the form of a physical award, probably a plaque, something that was actually in and of itself expensive and heavy, mm -hmm. right? A thing that that said this person is valuable, they achieved something, they they bettered their peers, right? Mm -hmm. They're the best of of whatever they are. And then of course through income, right? Through a through a bonus, through a promotion, which is still commonplace to this day. If you were to give a plaque to a millennial, right, they would immediately drop it in the trash can, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> On their way out the door. Like how they would actually be offended. Like, how dare you think that all this work I put in to separate myself and to do something great and to contribute to the company, and you thought I wanted a piece of metal mm -hmm. with something engraved on it, right? I mean, the thought, the thoughtfulness is still there. The idea of just, just trying to say, hey, we see you, you've done a great job, but the perspective is, and that's just a, it's just the language that you're speaking. The heart of the matter is I want to feel appreciated, right, On, in both generations. So it's just really interesting that, like, sometimes, the you know, at the very core, it's nothing's really changed all that much. But if right. you say it in the wrong language, you you actually offend more than you do show what you want to show. Yeah. So I was just, just as a highlight, but I think that's a lot of what I've learned is when you get into conversations with you know, people in our parents' generations, parents' generations, you ask them about their experience at work, their experience is very different. But if you dig into what they wanted to experience, what they, the words that they wanted to hear from their boss, the, what they wish it would have been like, or the things that were great about their work, what, a lot of that stuff turns out to be like, oh, yeah, I, to I feel the same way. Yeah. You know, like I totally see that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I think that's a really important distinction there because yeah. I think it, it speaks to things that I think we believe to be true, which is yeah. that humans are have intrinsic value to them. Yeah. Humans have intrinsic needs that yes. are, you know, true about just who we are as people, right. regardless of generation. And yeah. so there are things generationally in our experience of just world events and things of that nature mm -hmm. that have shaped who we are yeah. and how we go about and yeah. kind of operate in the world. But at the same time, yeah, like that desire for, you know, appreciation and, you know, respect and whatever the case may be. And, um, but I think it's, it's interesting and it might be helpful even if we just share some of our own experiences of yeah. our parents maybe right. and what, uh, where there maybe are some really notable differences is what their expectation of their employer was. Because I would say yeah. with my parents in particular, while they may have desired to have those things, right. they never expected it from their employer. Mm, and no. so although they might have appreciated having, you know, more recognition in that fashion, yeah. you know, from managers and supervisors, I think, you know, for my parents, it was really like, I go to work to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. It's very transactional because they give me a paycheck yeah. and I give them labor 
and that's all I'm asking for them. Yeah. Or that's all I expect from them. Yeah. And anything more than that is like, that's great. It's kind of icing on the cake. Yeah. Um, and I think what's changed, at least in my own experience that I found was like, well, I don't want that. Right. <laughs> you know, and I think that's what a lot of folks in our generation, you know, as millennials yeah. have seen and part of what's kind of creating that, you know, reaction that maybe we're seeing in the workforce now. I think it comes down to how people are raised. I mean, a lot of it is is about like if you're if you're raised, if you're let's say my you might use my dad as an example, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're raised by folks that are coming out of, and I'm using the word folks because I'm clearly a silent generation, um, it, that coming out of, you know, depression era, like just store away everything you have, be grateful for what little you do have. If you have a job, hold on to that thing with all your might, do whatever you're asked. Mm -hmm. And then they raise the baby boomers. They mm -hmm. raise this generation of people and they tell them about how hard things were. They tell them about how fortunate they are to have the opportunities that they have. And I think it just creates a situation where the message is go to work, keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, do what you're told, right? And don't have a lot of needs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that was the other thing. It's like just the emotional availability of parents then versus like what we experience probably being raised and what our children are experienced being raised. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, and again, speaking in generalities, but that's what we're doing in this, in this episode, right? Mm -hmm. We are just going to be much more emotionally available. And so what the message that that, my, my parents were very emotionally available to me growing up. And so the message that that taught me was that I'm allowed to have needs. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to want things. I'm allowed to be upset. I'm allowed to not feel like the relationship's okay and want to kind of restore that, whatever. But if you're not growing up in a situation where that's being promoted, you're not going to go to work and expect some person that's not even your family to sit down with you and go, you seem to really having a really hard day. What can we do to help you? Right. You know, like you expect to hear, shut up and do your job. Yeah. Right. So it's, 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 it's not so much only the workplace. The workplace is kind of an outpouring of, I think, of what happens in the home. Mm -hmm. And that, and that's what's been passed down to the, through the generations is that there's just more, um, emotional availability, more of a relational aspect, um, between parent and child that is uh, more around feelings, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so therefore, when you go to work and you have this relationship that's not meant to be parental, but you do hear people borrow that language when mm -hmm. they talk about the workplace and they talk about, and they shouldn't, but they talk about employees as kids, mm -hmm. right? You hear that all the time. And, and I think the reason why that language is being borrowed is because people drag that in to yeah. the workplace and it affects their expectations of who their employer is and, and who they're going to be right. in that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's really important that we um, not just gloss over the fact that there are these generations and yeah. there are these differences too, yeah. because I think the, the time in history that we're living in right now is one of the most unique that we've ever seen. So there's never been a time in human history where there's been literally five generations of human beings that may be working together in the same place. So that's never happened before. And then layer on top of that, the fact that we're living literally in the fastest technological transformation that's ever happened mm. in human history over the last 20 years. So we've got both of these things going on at the same time yeah. that I think it's really hard to overstate how right. impactful that is to what people expect from work, how they think work should happen, what companies are trying to do. And yeah. so, you know, this isn't, I, I don't think it's just something that's like, uh, you know, hey, let's just kind of like make this generation happy and move on. I think it's actually, we really have to fundamentally look at mm. how are companies designed to enable people to work mm. in a good way. And that's something we talked about in the last episode yeah. is this notion that work is good. Like we think it's a good thing for people to have that. And right. so it means that we really have to rethink how companies are designed to enable people to work mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah, no, we really do. And I, I mean, your point about technology, it actually just made me think about, somebody sent me 
um, on YouTube. It was like the first TV commercial ever for Microsoft Excel. I don't know if you've seen that. Mm -hmm. But it's hilarious. The, the TV commercial is showing this person that has built a spreadsheet and they drag a group of cells over to the right and the formula gets applied into the future. Uh -huh. And they're like in an elevator and everyone is just like, like minds just like brains out the back of their skull like what just happened uh -huh. you didn't have to do that manually and it just makes me think like that wasn't that long ago right and if you had to build a spreadsheet you were going to be working on that thing for weeks right you know like just on this one thing for this one meeting to give yeah. that one report if you weren't doing it on paper yeah if you weren't doing it on paper right and before that it was it's it done on paper and now the technology is at a place where I would expect someone to do that same work that took that person weeks, 30 years ago, to be able to get it done in a couple of hours and then go do another 40 task today. Right. Right. And the technology allows it, right? But is our brain chemistry caught up to the fact that we can achieve that much in one day? And so mm -hmm. it's just interesting because we're we're fighting against, not against, but we're fighting alongside technologies changing generational expectations, what a work day should look like, what you can accomplish in a work day. Right. Right. And I think if I would have started my career, which I didn't, but if I would have started my career 30 years ago and I'm still in that career now, I would feel like, wait, like, I'm expected to do so much mm -hmm. in one day. And I'm willing because I'm of the generation. I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to work hard, right? Mm -hmm. And but but I'm but I'm playing catch up all the time. Whereas I think sometimes, you know, if there's a cri any criticism that I could bring of our own generation, we've become so efficient at doing things that sometimes we can put in two or three hours of work and we sit back and go, I accomplished kind of a lot today. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just like I'm probably good, right? <laughs> like, and you kind of see that reflected in this tension between like you know those of a of a you know older generation are just like you guys don't even work yeah. you know and the younger generation's like actually we're achieving a whole lot right we're just doing it more efficiently and it's 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 probably blowing your mind a little bit but like how do we learn from each other in that right you know like how do we not just go well they're old and wrong and we're young and right 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 yeah. or if you're sitting on the other and we're kind of sitting in the middle you know the two of us yeah. but or go, all oh, those young, lazy people, they don't know how to put in an honest day's work, right? And why don't they do it? In my, like, neither one is correct right. fully. And I, and I think, you know, what's sad to me about the workplace is it seems like it's gotten, it's gotten to a place where there's not a lot of knowledge sharing, and, and I would even use the word like wisdom sharing, mm -hmm. between the generations. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, I, I think there's not a lot of respect given to the knowledge and experience of those that have gone before. Yeah. And there's also not a lot of patience and understanding given to the younger generations right. of maybe you're not actually just worthless and lazy. Yeah. Maybe you just have something to teach me. sit down and be quiet. <laughs> right, yeah. Be grateful for your paycheck. Be grateful for your paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that you can't ignore that tension in this conversation right. because I think it's one of the good reasons to talk about it is to help open the conversation of every generation has something to offer. And then the other side of the coin, of course, we're going to get to is if you're an employer you you've got to think about how do I employ well mm -hmm. all five of these generations and how do I treat them really well? How do I have proper expectations for them? That is just such a right. huge challenge. Yeah. Huge well, challenge. I think that understanding between generations is so important because, you know, as we talked about that shift that's happening over the next five years, yeah. I think companies are just grossly unprepared yeah. for what's happening. Yeah. And some of that I think is, you know, let's say the the arrogance of maybe older millennials like us that are kind of on the cusp of like Gen X yeah. and then those older generations that are frankly the ones that are running companies for yep. the most part. Yep. And Still so calling the shots. Yeah. Those are the ones that, you know, tend to even when they're trying to be empathetic, um, I think sometimes lack the full understanding mm -hmm. of how different the experience of the world is right. for that new generation. And so I was thinking it'd be fun to even think about like some of the examples, cause for one, for instance, uh, like cell phones, yes. you know, where like we remember a time in our lives, I'm 38, that mm -hmm. that was not 
commonplace. Mm -mm. Like I got a cell phone my first year in college. It was a flip phone, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty damn was cool. Pretty cool yeah. With the green backlit screen, yeah. you know, and you had to like press like 999 buttons mm -hmm. to like send one text message. Yeah. And like, so you just didn't send text messages right, exactly. because it was too difficult. Yeah. And like, that was kind of the reality versus, you know, when I look at what Gen Z is today, yeah. like my daughter is yeah. in Gen Z. So Gen Z is a, anyone whose age is 10 to 25 right now. And so her familiarity with like a cell phone texting, like how you interact with that technology is just so different right. from what I experienced. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and I think, you know, if you're employing people of these different generations, that's where the serious challenge comes in because you, you have to have the wisdom to understand like where we started the episode. You have to understand what is... Um, what are the common threads that span across all, right? And you, it's because, because that you have to find those. Because if you don't find those, right. you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to contextualize every single thing you're doing based on how old people are, what their experience has been, and so forth, right? So you do have to do that also because you've got to personalize to some extent. But if you spend 100% of your time trying to personalize messages, you'll just go insane. Like You've got to find ways to communicate and, and you've got to find the heart of the matter. And so, you know, I think one of the things, you know, we talked about appreciation, you know, but I think another thing is just people want to, people want to understand how what they do, it doesn't matter if they're 55 years old or they're 22 years old, they want to understand what, how does what I do contribute to the greater cause of the company, right? Mm -hmm. That is not a new idea. The new idea is that the causes, social and otherwise, that the company stands for ought to be aligned with what I stand for, right? That is a very younger generation thing. I don't think the older generations mm -hmm. care about that whatsoever because their identity is not associated with the company nearly as tightly. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. That's another episode, I think, right? It's uh -huh. around how we go about our society and navigate the world. Um, but everybody wants to feel like their job matters. And I think that one of the challenges is that for the older generations that are not in the leadership role, right? That are in you know that VP level, manager level, whatever it is, they can easily feel like the world's kind of passing me by. I'm just sort of like hanging out, waiting for retirement. I'm just trying to get mm -hmm. to the finish line. I'm not really vital to this company anymore. And that's what I was, that's, you know, going back, hearkening back to this idea of like that wisdom transfer, you know, like there's just stuff that yeah. you cannot learn in a book. You can't even learn through your first four or five, 10 years in your career that we, we need to be, having more mentorship type of relationships between the older and younger generations so that that stuff can get passed through, right? So that we don't grow businesses where, you know, and again, back to that same criticism where of the millennial generation and down, and again, generalizing, where we don't actually learn how, you said it in the last episode, we don't actually learn how to do satisfying work. We don't learn how to hustle to the point of, Wow, I worked really, really hard this week, and like, and I have this clear accomplishment in front of me. We and we were just talking to somebody before we started recording, uh, who's sitting in the room, is saying that he feels guilty working too hard. Mm -hmm. Like, what boomer would have ever said, "I feel guilty working too hard"? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, and like, can you work too hard? Absolutely, right? Yeah. You absolutely can. You can work yourself into the ground. But I think this belief has come to bear in our generation and perhaps the younger generations that work is the enemy. Right. And I just need to work as little as possible so that I can go live. Yeah. And, and, and just missing the fact that the living that you plan to do will actually be far less satisfying yeah. if you don't strive and work really hard to feel like you actually earned the living and you actually like need the rest and you need the yeah. restoration that comes with the time off because you gave it all you had when you were working. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I just, 
that stuff just needs to get talked about between these generations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and and it's really fascinating. So um, Marcus Buckingham talks about this in his book Nine Lies About Work. And, you know, we talk about this concept too, but basically the false dichotomy of work-life balance, because I right. think it's just ridiculous. Because like you said, work-life balance sets up this, you know, uh, you know, uh, it puts work and life at odds with one yes. another. Like yes. work is negative right. and we want to do as little of it as possible so that we can get around to our living because right. life is where all the good stuff happens. Yeah. And it's actually not true about how humans are wired, yeah. that some of the most fulfilling things that we can do are intimately and integrally tied into the work that we do. Yeah. And so, you know, psychologists talk about it as flow. You know, when you get into those states of like, I'm doing work that I love, you lose track of time, like, you know, and it doesn't even feel like work. I mean, you might feel like, hey, I worked hard, yeah. but it wasn't draining or it wasn't exhausting. It was yeah. actually highly energizing. Yeah. And so finding ways to create more of that is actually gonna be positive for everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really funny that we believe that false dichotomy because if you think about how we play, like if you think of just how do people play, they set up competitive games, games. with yeah. rules that they can lose. Right. And they have to exert themselves and they have to think really hard and try yeah. really. Think about camping. People criticize camping and I get why they do, <laughs> but like people put themselves out of the home that they have right. with running water and electricity and intentionally make life a lot harder to go in the woods and set up a tent and sleep with the wild animals on right. the stars. <laughs> That's work, yeah. right? But it's satisfying because you wake up in the morning and you're like, I just slept out in the wilderness. Like, yeah. I don't need all this house and electricity and stuff. Like, I, I'm tough, you know? Like, there's something really cool about that. And right. so, like, why do we believe that work is bad when all we end up doing when we're not working is setting up ways for us to work. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a maybe that's an interesting distinction. Is you know previous generations never expected work to feel like play, right? But true. there's maybe more of a desire yeah. that's being expressed for that to be true. Because if you think about kids, like play is how you explore the world, and yeah. so play is how you engage with things that are new or fun, or it's a, it's a lot of how you learn. Yeah. And so like, why wouldn't we want work to feel more like play? And then it becomes right. this thing that's fully integrated into your life because the problem with that dichotomy is when you set it up is, you know, these two things that are at odds with one another. I mean, think about how much time you have to spend at work. Like it's unavoidable unless you've got some giant trust fund, right. like, yeah. you know, happen to, but like, I mean, even the research on people that- Well, we had some trust fund kids as clients back right. in the day and how happy were those people? <laughs> yeah, like, miserable, that's where I was going. The most miserable people. Well, because it tells you something yeah. about human nature, yeah. which is we need responsibility mm -hmm. for something because the responsibility gives us purpose. Yeah. And that purpose is what actually gives us satisfaction. So if we don't have Perfectly a purpose said. to strive yeah. for, which is I think the appeal of games, right? Yeah. We set up these competitive games because what are we doing? We're aiming for a goal mm -hmm. collectively. Right. And it's a whole hell of a lot of fun when you're aiming for a goal collectively. And so that's more or less what we should be what doing business is. in business, yeah. right? And so, I mean, it'd be really interesting to talk about, you know, we, we haven't figured all this stuff out. That's why we're talking about yeah, it. Absolutely. But what are some of the things that we've been trying around here at Fringe that you feel like, you know, we've seen some success with? Gosh, I mean, just in terms of kind of like gaming, finding the work experience or just- Yeah, or, yeah. or building, I mean, you know, in the last episode, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the different, experience people have expressed mm -hmm. when they've come to work here. And so it's not to, you know, self-congratulate ourselves <laughs> yeah. on what we've built right. here. Yeah. Um, I've actually found it quite surprising, yeah. you know, how much people have emoted about that experience. Mm -hmm. Because again, you know, you and I didn't have a ton of, you know, corporate experience yeah. or we didn't work at startups before right. big companies or small companies. We yeah. kind of just did solopreneur things and started a small company that was the two of us. And so yeah. I don't think we had expectations. So for me, it's actually been more surprising, but it, it feels like there's some things that we're doing that seem to be working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of it's cultural, right? I think a lot of it is is how you talk about 
people, right? Um, I, I think it's the words you use, right? So I, I think they're one of the biggest problems, like when, when we play, right? When we go, we get on the team and we play a game, it's all very egalitarian. And I'm not saying that that's how the workplace should be. You absolutely need authority and you actually need leaders and so forth. However, you you don't have to talk down to people, right? You don't have to call yourself the person's boss all the time. You could say we work together, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to say I'm this many levels up or down. Or like it's some of the language that I think is problematic. And I don't care what generation you're in. Mm -hmm. That it's just not the right way to approach somebody and say, hey, we're all human beings. We're all here to work. We're all here to achieve a goal. Like, let's go get this done. And it immediately sets up a situation where because I'm me and you're you, we're going to do it my way. My opinion is just the one that I'll, it, it, it just silences people, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like that you, you're constantly reminding people that they're not important as you are, mm -hmm. which is, first of all, not true from a human level. But secondly, just really stifles the creativity in the room. And I think prevents people from having that courage to say, I got an idea. Mm -hmm. Like it's my first week and I'm 22 years old and I'm fresh out of school and I have an idea. And then my idea might be terrible, mm -hmm. but it might be the thing that takes your company to the next level, right? And you will not hear it unless you show that humility and that respect. Yeah. Uh, and so I think we've, I think we've just set up a place where, and, and again, I don't want to pat myself on the back or you or anybody else, but it's there's a humility in leadership that I think brings everybody's voice to bear. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that we've done is I think we've allow people to work in the way that they need to work based on their their situation right yeah. like if they're they're solo at home and that's you know they they get distracted that you know or they they can't focus they need to come into the office we have that available they mm -hmm. can do that they can be engaged that way if they're like you and me with a bunch of kids at home it's like we need to escape we got to get here but occasionally it's like I got to just like lock myself in a room. And so I want to go home, right? Like right. having those options available and being able to provide different, you know, means for people, I think has been big. Um, I think, again, that's a generation, generational experience as well, mm -hmm. because you need different things when you're 25 than you do when you're 35 and 45 and 55 right. in your workplace and in your environment. And, and also the time, right? Like, I don't mind any of our employees hearing that like every, what is it, Wednesday, mm -hmm. I leave at three o'clock. I go home, I grab my daughter, I take her to gymnastics. Mm -hmm. We're there from 4.30 to 6. A lot of times I'll sit and watch her. Sometimes I'll do a little work in the car. Sometimes it's a mix of both, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I'm here at 10 o'clock at night right doing this because this is play right? right for me this is fun but it's you know it's also it counts it's work right yeah. and so just that flexibility to you know work when you want to work and play when you want to play like there's a trust that you give over and not everybody can handle that trust right mm -hmm. and that's why you got to be first really careful about who you hire right. and also like not try to hold on to people that you don't think can actually mature quickly and yeah. handle the trust but if you can trust people with that time and give them that freedom, it's just a beautiful thing because they appreciate so they appreciate it so so much, mm -hmm. right? And it really elicits a whole lot of loyalty and respect and goodwill between you know the two parties. Yeah. So I mean, I could go on about a lot of things that we've done. To, I think ameliorate the traditional um, you know corporate environment. Everyone catch that? Yeah. <laughs> Don't call it out. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if I was going to have to tip you off there, give you a little help on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the the trust piece really resonates with me because, you know, in, in my mind, I, I like to think about, you know, is there is there a critical lever that makes a lot of other things work? Mm. Right. So there's lots of tactics that you can implement to make things work in your company. Yeah you know, flexible work schedules, yada, 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 the benefits that you provide, all these kinds of things that, yeah. you know, help communicate mm -hmm. something. But it really starts, I think, with that trust. It's yeah. like the reciprocity that comes from, you know, organization leaders saying to their people, hey, I trust you to, you understand the job and just you work when you need. Mm -hmm. Like, you yeah. don't necessarily have the hours. Like, 
Yeah. Just get it done. Right. Well, and, I mean, too, as as someone who's an introvert, yeah. and I know you're an extrovert, yeah. even like the experience of flexibility of workplaces, it's like, I mean, there's some days where I'm just like, I'd prefer to work at home, even with the kids running around downstairs, because mm. like, I just need to focus, right. I need that time, yeah. like, there's something about right. that. And like, I don't think twice about it, because mm. there is that flexibility yeah. that actually enables the work to happen in the way that it needs to happen. And so right. I think that's a really powerful thing. If we can design that experience yeah. for all employees. Yeah. And it has to be done with a lot of intention. It does. I, and I think I think the quality of your employees is more important than ever because if you're going to lead from a standpoint of trust, that's a very different thing from leading out of fear. Because mm -hmm. you can drive people that are not actually that great of an employee through fear mm. to just do the job, right? And you probably could get further with less talented people if you're leading out of fear. Um, not really an enjoyable way to lead, not an enjoyable thing for the people working for you, but from an effectiveness standpoint, you probably could get more out of less, so to speak, right? Yeah. But if you're going to lead out of trust, you need not only talented people, but mature people and self-motivated people and people that don't need somebody because you can't have somebody looking over their shoulder all the time, literally, physically, right? Right. Um, so that, that it really changes, I think, how you need to look at the talent pool. Yeah. Ultimately. I think that's a great question in some respects to wrap up on. So yeah. this idea, are you driving people out of fear? Are you leading out of trust? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of things that, you know, you could answer about your company based on, you know, the way that you would respond to that question. Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, we do have a longstanding tradition on this show now that we're on the second episode, episode. here um, where I do pick a word somewhat at random. Word of I, the day, by the way, today was ameliorate. If you didn't listen to the first episode, it's true. that's why Jason kind of freaked out when I said the word ameliorate earlier. It was the secret word of the day. And it was well placed and well used in the course <laughs> think, of this conversation. I think accurate, and accurate, yeah. yes. I can attest to that fact. So I did come up with the word of today myself and didn't use Google to find this one. So <laughs> Our word of today that will be woven into the conversation of the next episode is cacophony. Wow. <laughs> I love how you're up in the ante immediately <laughs> from ameliorate to cacophony. Uh, I know okay. how much you love words. So. I do. I do. Yeah. And I'm a little bit of a This is going to be fun. Yes. Let's do it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Episode two of How People Work. We're really enjoying this. I hope you're really enjoying this. And we'll see you on the next one.